Alright, welcome to Yo Radio Talk Show number 27, episode number 27, on February 25th, 2006. And I do have several guests here with me today and everything. And we're actually going to be doing something a little bit different um, than normal, as you probably all know. I usually am the one who pretty much does, you know, the talk show. So what I've decided to do this week is maybe uh, let DJ uh, Spiderbite over here. Uh, who's going to be uh, sitting in on the panel as well. Uh, he's going to be hosting the show, and I'm going to sit back and basically be y'all's co-host for this afternoon. But, you know, I want to thank every, each and every one of you guys out there for tuning in for the uh, talk show. So I'm going to go ahead and basically introduce everybody, and then I'm going to let uh, Spidebite here take over. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and introduce uh, Spidebite. Say hello to everybody out there, Spider. Hello, everybody. Uh Hopefully, uh, everybody, as usual, will be patient with me since, just once again, I'm putting training wheels back on, being my first uh, hosting experience versus my regular shows. And, uh, yes, I'm from Siege Perilous, and I think uh, we've got a pretty good show for you today. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on down to the, to the next guest, wife. All right. And, uh, yes, as he said earlier, you know, just right there and then, uh, we're going to have a great show for all you people out there who are wondering what are some of the conversations going to be. It's going to be about a little bit of role playing this afternoon and everything. So for all you people out there who role play, uh, we got various different people here. We got special guests uh, from Europa, uh, one of them being uh, uh, Kendall, or uh, correct me if I'm saying that wrong or whatever. It's Kendall, I think it's what it is. And uh, she comes from Baronship of Cove on Europa. Go ahead, uh, Kendall, and say hello to everybody out there. Hi, it's Kendall, if you're wondering, but hi, this is me. Okay, Kendall. Uh, it's great having you here with us today, this afternoon, and everything. And uh, let's see, we have Win, uh, Mayor Winfield from Pax Slayer, who uh, comes from Chesapeake. Say hello to everybody out there. Hail and well met, everybody. Winfield here from Chesapeake. Glad to be here. Yep, and I am, of course, uh, DJ Bytroy from Chesapeake as well. And uh, so with that said, go ahead, Spider Bite. It's all yours now. Well, uh, like we said earlier, we got quite an agenda today. Um, I'm looking f- forward to hearing what uh, the two here on our panel have to say, as well as, uh, you know, as many comments as you'd like to throw out their advice. Uh, be my partner in crime today. Um, also, from the listeners in IRC, um, and I want to encourage before we get started, you know, if you're not in the IRC channel and you're just listening to us right now, jump in there so that we can hear what you have to say on, you know, the topics today. Uh, you can talk to us and with your fellow listeners. So let me really quick give you the instructions. Just go to yourradio.com. On the left-hand side, there's an IRC chat link. Click on it. It will give you step-by-step instructions to get in there so you can communicate with us and the panel guests and the other listeners. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing we wanted to throw out there, and um, yeah, it's going to toss off our little RP theme for the day, but I wanted to get it out there because I was curious what the listeners and what the other panel guests had to say about it. I know some people don't read boards or don't concern themselves with anything goes on behind the curtain over at EA. But with the announcement of uh, Aaron, quote unquote, dark scribe Cohen, uh, being the new uh, UO producer, uh, and Mr. Tact, of course, as the new live team lead designer. Um, does this affect any of you guys here on the panel at all? Um, you know, especially with all the current changes underway. Um, in the PvP arena, it's going a major uh, overhaul. Um, is this a good move, a bad move, good timing, bad timing? Um, remember, keep in mind, Dark Stripe's a marketing man. So was this a move on EA's part to get somebody in marketing over to make the people happy and turn a buck? Or, you know... I just want to hear people's thoughts because people seem to get really emotional about this kind of stuff. Um, do you see this public relations move um, on EA's part? What about Mr. Uh, Tax new role and, uh, with all the gunfire going on over the latest proposed PvP changes? Is it good timing for him to take that step or bad timing? Um, let me hear just quick what you have to say. Uh, Vice, go ahead. Sure. You know, i got a lot of things to say, <laughs> say about that, actually, and everything. Um, one of the things I am actually kind of curious about, and to be honest, I was actually uh, posting this up on the uh, Stratix forums over there uh, uh, yesterday, last night, before I went to bed, and uh, I was just reading over all the posts, you know, basically people congratulating them, uh, asking questions about the uh, people that are taking over the producer position and stuff like that, 
Uh, some of the questions which people were asking, what, well, does this place, uh, person play Ultima Online? Is it, you know, stuff like that? I think that's a very valid question, you know, to be asking some of these people that are moving up the chain or whatever at EA. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about that. And, um, and yes, the, uh, as you pointed out and everything, the guy, Aaron Cohen, uh, aka Dark Scrot, he's, uh, also the marketing guy, or used to be, and now he's a producer. So, it has to make you wonder, you know, is he there to just simply try to make the product better to yield more revenues for the game or, or EA? But, you know, to be honest, when I look at this guy and being him being a marketing guy, I see great potential here for a pre-UR uh, shard. So all you people out there who are tuned in and in favor or supportive of a pre-UR shard, I think if any producer is going to sign off on that, it's going to be this guy. I honestly feel that way about this guy. Um, and also, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of new changes coming about uh, here in the future because, I mean, we got a new client uh, guy over there in the engineering department that's going to be working on the client that used to be Mr. Tack. Now Mr. Tack is like the lead designer on the live team and everything. So that means there's going to be a lot of bug fixes, a lot of problems being fixed, and it and Long term, he's going to be committed to fixing all those because that's his position now. So, I mean, that's a great thing in my opinion. So, uh, back to you, Spider. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I'm seeing good stuff um, that will come out of this uh, mix-up. I mean, and I say that in a good way, not a bad way. Uh, but it's shake-up. That's what it is, shaking up the team a little bit. You know, new members here, old members coming from other teams. Um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of good stuff, in my opinion. Um, one thing that I did know from a lot of threads, and then I went and I talked to people who had actually met Aaron at, some, at, a, at a meetup or two. I think it was around the SE launch or something like that. Back when they had the video, um, he was actually one of the ninjas in that video, by the way, if anybody had a chance to see that. So that led me to go talk to some people who went to the meetups and um, some of them had said that he has said that he is very, very, very into role play in the game. So that's something to think about too. Um, hopefully, his sway on that will give a give an opportunity to put more story into it. Like we used to get tons of story with our events, with our publishers, with our expansions. Who actually knew or could tell you how the elves came to Cesaria? You know, unless they went way back in history and read every single NPC book and played Ultima 1 through 9. For the average casual player, all that means is new towns, new monsters, and new dungeons. No story, no depth. Maybe this guy can come in and um, implement some of that old feeling again, which is uh, what I'm hoping we're going to get to talk about today, too. Get some of that old roleplay feeling back into the game again. Uh, with that said, um, Winfield. Mayor Winfield, please go ahead. By all means, let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, so I don't, uh, I don't know Dark Scribe uh, at all. Really, haven't tracked his progress in, in marketing. But uh, the question that comes to mind is, what makes a good producer of a production? And UO is a production. And in my mind, the uh, producer needs to number one have a real good feel for the customer base. Obviously, a marketer, a successful marketer, would probably know that. Also, a producer would know what is uh, technically feasible, working with engineers, technicians, uh, programmers. So without uh, knowing Dark Scribe or uh, his specific background, it sounds to me if you are a successful marketer and you're looking across things very broadly across your customer base, not just to make a buck, but to make something interesting. You'll make a buck off of the uh, off of UO, by making it interesting and staying tuned to your customer needs. Well said. Well said. And, and you're right. And uh, in my opinion, I believe that's why they chose Dark Scribe. He's got the marketing background, so he's not going to miss, you know, every time they seem to make a change based on, you know, the feedback that they get through these elusive emails, which to date I've never received one. <laughs> And it's not in my spam folder. I don't know. But um, they, they go by these surveys and all this other stuff. And next thing you know, you got these changes being made. And one group of players is happy. Another is not. You know, maybe they needed a marketing guy with marketing experience to come in and be the producer of the team so that he doesn't, he won't overlook 
one group or another, and then you, heck, for all we know, maybe uh, the next time uh, after he's done and we get another expansion or something, there will only be a post every week or two in the UO Hall. I know, that's hoping for too much, but anyways. Um, good points, very good points on that. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do because, you know, being a marketer, um, that means he's good with schematics. And that also means uh, that, um, oh, the fact that he's deep into role play, that's something that I look forward to, hoping to see that influence in it. Um, did anybody else have anything to say on that subject before I move on? I wanted to really just throw that out there quickly, to be honest, before we got into the meat of our discussion today, um, because it was something that was on a lot of people's players' minds. Uh, unless somebody has anything else to say, I'll just move on to our next subject. All right. Um, kind of on the same thing. Um, not not necessarily. It's not not necessarily a. a a uh, developer, engineering, programming sort of thing. Um, I wanted to talk about, has anybody seen the website for the Japanese market? Uh, for, you know, the over on the UO.com, I can't remember the URL exactly, but it goes to the Japanese version of the website for their gameplay. Um, if you haven't, check it out. It looks like a lot of time, effort, money has been invested into this, into the Japanese market for U Ultima Online. I don't know if anybody follows this stuff, but, um, you know, is the player base growing that much in Japan that EA has chosen to invest into that growth rather than the, e the U.S. and the European? Um, for example, sex change and name tokens are currently available on the Japanese website for purchasing game. And, unless my uh, currency uh, calculator is off, Six dollars cheaper than what it, co what it costs right now to call EA and uh, get a name change. So, um, you know, this doesn't really. Um, I, I, I know, I know, Vice wants to talk about it, I, and, and I hope you guys have something to say. But, you know, in my own opinion, what I'm, con I'm confused about is: is this a, a marketing thing? Is this where they're going for the buck because the Japanese market's booming so much in UO? They're getting Sears. They're getting everything. Um, or are they just the next guinea pig? Are they the replacement for Origin? That's that's what I'm um, wondering. So, uh, Vice Rick, go ahead and let us know what you think. Sure, you know, and just to re kind of reiterate what you just uh, was saying earlier and everything, I have been paying attention to what was going over on the Japanese website, and what I've noticed is that this Japanese website has had a total rebound of its website. I mean, you look at yo.com, which is the website for all the English speaking people that know how to read, write, and speak, uh, uh, or read and write English, you know. So this is ideally the website in which all the Europeans and Americans go to and all that. And you look over at the Japanese website and they've got a total facelift of their website. It's no longer like our website, you know, which is what the Japanese website used to look like. Now you go over there, you find a uh, not only do they have a revamp of their website, which makes the game more appealing for newcomers who are looking into the game or thinking about getting into the game, they come to this website at yo.com for, you know, let's just say we're talking about a person who can read and write English, okay? Uh, if he goes to yo.com website and he sees the uh, website and then he knows a little about, about what friends have told him and stuff like that, or he goes and looks for the product to buy. He goes to the UO.com website, clicks on Visitor Center, and he gets a link that takes him to, you know, Ages of Shadow for Ultima Line. We're talking about Ages of Shadow. Do you know how long ago Ages of Shadow came out? I, if I'm not mistaken, it came out in like 2003 or something. A product that is three years old is still being marketed on the UO.com, the official website for Ultima Online for the English uh, player base, you know, and uh, so this goes for the people over in the UK, uh, people in, in most parts of Europe, and uh, in the Americans, you know, we, we don't get a rebound. I'm kind of wondering, are we ever going to see a rebound? And on top of that, to add insult to injury, you also see that the uh, Japanese are getting the tokens before us, they're getting the spring decor tokens, you're going to have to wait a few... Uh, uh, later on in the year to get those, uh, you're gonna have to wait until, 
uh, March 3rd. I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. It's not a big wait for to uh, get these uh, uh, name and sex change tokens or whatever. But it is the fact that we are like secondary, you know, yet we're paying more than the Japanese market because the uh, exchange rate. And I, and I and I don't know if it's like you said the marketing or whatever. But I can tell you, even with the exchange rate. The yen versus the dollar is not going to fluctuate where it's going to make a $6 difference in one day's time. It's not going to fluctuate that big to make that big of a difference when purchasing from a Japanese market or purchasing from an American market. So, I mean, obviously, to me, what it looks like is that the Japanese market are getting these game time codes, uh, tokens, and everything else. Far cheaper than what we're getting. So, uh, is it is that to lure people in to get them to spend more, or is it because they don't have as much money to spend, or what? I'd like to know, and I obviously ain't gonna get those answers here today. But hopefully, in the future, we'll see those kind of answers being answered later on down the road. Um, so, I mean, what I think personally needs to be done. I think it needs to be there. Needs to be a medium. You know, it it, it should be fair. I mean, I can understand if they're trying to reach out to third world countries or countries where they maybe make $200 a year then yeah that would be um, that would make more sense to you know make it cheaper and stuff but we're talking about Japan a big powerful country that is economically rich and so to give them these breaks or or whatever and to say well we're going to sit the Americans over here and the Europeans with the high hefty price tag that's absolutely wrong, in my opinion. That's not good public relations. And what? And see, and, and I honestly feel like you know, in a lot of ways, they they're just doing this because they you know they didn't ever really expect us to find out about this. So, uh, and it, and and last but not least, my last argument here, my last point on this is what I'm, you know they're already getting these tokens and everything cheap. So are they in essence? Are they also getting their uh, monthly subscription fees cheaper than us? I mean, I think uh, if you sign up for six months over here in the United States, it's 9.95 for six months, and that's all up front. So I'm kind of wondering what their subscription rates are and stuff like that. So, anyways, back to you. Uh, yeah, good point, Spice. Um, uh, by the way, if you could, I lost my link. I had it on my desktop somewhere, but they're asking for the link to the Japanese website in the IRC channel. If you could just oh, paste sure. that in there when you get a chance. Um, yeah, no, you make good points. Um, making the, the all these these services cheaper, um, you know, if they're spending you know lots of money on the website, there's obviously lots of money coming in. That's the only way you can offer something for a less price if you're selling more volume of it. So, you know, again, my thoughts go back to. Um, is it booming that much over there that really you know maybe the Japanese. Um, or they're loving you oh they're not you know, I mean, I'm sure they're complaining about it but there's still are there that many more subscribers than US subscribers to to, to, to vet to warrant hiring a porn star to come on and do commercials for UO and stuff like that over there who knows um, that was something that really caught my eye and I know a lot of people are really wondering hey why are they getting all this attention um, and all this new stuff, and they still have their SEER program. And it was something we'll get into later when we do, as we drop into the RP uh, theme that we're going to get into next um, in, a, in a little bit. Um, so with that segue, role play in UO. Now I'm not going to go, I'm not talking the traditional, the these and the thous, the miladies and my lords, you know, but the sense of a purpose, a storyline, um, you know, a goal for the players in UO. When you log in, what's your goal? What is the first thing you do? Is it to go get that bod filled? Um, is it to go out and train and get that next few guaranteed games points? Um, are you going to go sit there and womp on something for uh, four hours straight until you get the power scroll you want? Does anybody remember going back and actually having a purpose? I mean, when you went to fight a dragon, you know, you took a bunch of your friends out there, and it was a quest to go kill a dragon. Back when dragons were hard to kill, that is. That's another subject we'll get in later. Um, is it the loot? Um, what's driving you to go out and fight other people? Is it their stuff? Is it, um, you know, 
what is it? Is, is, do you just want to kill people? Do you want to kill, you know, need to make that millions and millions of gold? Where's the purpose in UO now? Where's the, uh, where's the role-playing in it? I've, I've played in role-playing guilds and solo role-playing my entire UO career. You know, I've, it, you know, even while I'm role-playing, I'll take, I'll have a character that's a role player, and then I'll have a character that's not a role player. That way I'm not overwhelmed. But it just seems to me, you know, they, we, we used to have order and chaos. Remember that? And then they snuffed out chaos. So now we don't even have that to go with. Um, we have factions. But what's factions? Selling rights is cheap to everybody. Um, going out on spawn hunts with your guild. What, do you go in there and going, let's go conquer the beast and get the mythical scrolls? Or is it, okay, we got to get about 50 of these tonight or we're not going to be able to sell them on our vendors tomorrow. You know, I, I, this is where we're going with the role play. And this is where our guests are going to really have a good time today, I think. So um, what I wanted to do is uh, suggest one thing. Uh, we have the zoo and the library reward, rewards right now. Um, what, what do my guests here today think about... Um, implementing that into PvP or um, PVM even, you know, um, hopefully in a system, I don't know, maybe they can intertwine it with factions or with the guild system, probably be more preferable. But as you accomplish something, a quest, a goal, you know, not none of these crafter quests, but a, a goal, you go and you kill a peerless together as a guild, fighting off your enemies who are warred with you, you get so many points towards your shard, just like the library rewards and the zoo rewards. And, um, and, and you know, will that bring more purpose into the game? You've got a, you know, you've got a, a quest, a, um, a motive to go out and do something that can be made into role play. So, with that said, um, uh, let me go ahead and uh, talk to Mayor Winfield first. Let me go ahead and uh, let you go ahead, Mayor. Hi again. Yeah, the um, kind of the issue at mind to me is the uh, it's basically an items-based kind of achievement system that programmers can put into the game, and it's up to players to role play around these achievements that they could do. You know, getting various things to build a zoo, to feed the animals, uh, to build the cages, are basically. Uh, achievement-based kind of mechanics to meet a goal. Uh, what we can do beyond that is more or less role-playing the creativity, and I'm not sure personally how to apply uh, that kind of mechanic uh, to uh, to create a role-playing environment around that with creativity, storylines, depth of of conversation, things like that. Uh, but ultimately, I think the art of role-playing is simply immerse yourself into the game, into the realm, and you do things that are from your character's point of view, not necessarily the player, because you could log on to another character and you could play that character completely differently. Um, and that, that's kind of where I think uh, the role-playing can come in, but it's very much player-based community-based to try to take the mechanics that the programmers provide, like books, being able to write in books, you put your history in the books, if you want to know the background of a person, look at their profile. So I think it's more of a challenge uh, to go beyond the game mechanics with what we can do as players. Good point. Very good point. It is. It's tough to go beyond the game mechanics or to overlook them. You know, um, advice and I were talking about it today. You got a he, uh, you've got a um, situation where you may want to be in, uh, um, a, a overlook a game mechanic of some sort and say we, as a guild, are not going to do that because we're role playing this or or that. Uh, we're elves. We're not going to wear plate because it's too heavy for us. We're light, you know, limbed elves or whatever. And um, next thing you know, your enemy guild is suited up in nothing but plate armor if plate armor made a difference these days I'm just using this as an analogy but um, well then what choice do you have but to go throw the plate on anyways you know the game yeah the game mechanics can get in the way or you can uh, overlook them and play it and have fun because it depends I guess it depends on where your heart is as far as role play goes you make very good points um, 
Viceroy was next, and then uh, Kendall. I'll, I'll, I'll take you right after him. All right. Uh, my point is this, and everything. You did bring up an interesting point, but, you know, I've actually heard a better idea, which I think would actually be more suitable for a role-playing community aspect, is that I've actually heard people with player-run towns and stuff like that, uh, similar to what uh, Mayor Winfield has uh, going on on his shard. Um, I don't really know so much about Baron Chippeco, but I'll let her uh, explain that a little bit uh, more as to whether or not they got like a player-run town going on or, or not. But I do know there's been uh, recommendations or suggestions at you know, town hall meetings, uh, especially at the Washington, D.C., where people could basically create a town stone, you know, like a, like a town center for their uh, player-run town, and basically be able to deposit gold and resources into it to build up their town and maybe uh, put little, uh, you know, town structures in their town uh, within a certain radius uh, from the uh, town center, you know, this or, or the town stone. So within this radius, you know, that would be like the um, boundaries of the town and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I think that would be probably a better approach, you know, to get people to, you know, work together or even maybe... Uh, come together for the um, role-playing aspects of player-run towns and stuff like that. Because, I mean, that that to me would be more appealing rather than some kind of community thing where, you know, where if you're outside the town, it, you know, because it'll, 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 in other words, it'll pull you into wanting to be a part of this town because then you can actually contribute to it if you're a part of it by uh, joining up with this uh, township or whatever or declaring your fidelity to this township and stuff like that. I think that's what really needs to happen then, you know, and then the conflict can go from there whereas, you know, factions, it's, you know, it's there's no purpose in it, you know, other than to what what can you get out of it. Uh, maybe which is resources and stuff like that. But, you know, other than that, faction really serves no purpose or real meaning to me other than, you know, it, j it just don't, you know. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah, you make a good point, Vice, um, on a lot of them. You made me think, too, um, the way the faction system could be could be redone, one of the ways, at least. Um, instead of the singles having to be sit in, um, you know, the play in, in the game towns, why not be able to place them in a player-run town? Man, would that just spark up activity again. I know on our shard over on Siege, they're just begging for more activity in the player-run towns, the raids, etc. That would do it. Uh, but I, I want to give Kendall a chance. I know she's been waiting pretty patiently, and I appreciate that. Go ahead, Kendall. That's all right. I really like that idea with the town stones. Um, everything, without the town stones, everything's pretty much manual. I mean, you have to create your mayor, you have to create the government, you have to create all your different buildings. I mean, they're just player buildings. I mean, they're not... They don't have any NPCs or anything in them. You have to ever do everything yourself. The player runs on it really and some, some simplifies things really well. I mean, you could there'd be so much more order if people knew what was going on rather than having to go on what's on the site. I mean, if you knew that you're part of this town and uh, you know what your town is and you know everything about that, then it's much easier. But if you're kind of going by what the site says and what what the rules are, what the laws are, it's it's a little bit different. But I was talking about the the quest you're talking about the uh, the, the, the zoo and the um, this, the new uh, quest of the new expansion, Monday's Legacy. Um, we don't, since none of them are really code based, we pretty much had our own quest. We, uh, like, for, for example, we had the um, the Cove invasion when they had all these orcs and all the uh, other creature, creatures uh, invading Cove. We, uh, I wasn't there at the time, but the guild actually had a a big event around trying to, to defend Cove, defend Cove, and try to drive out, trying to drive out the orcs. And uh, I remember, I guess one of the EMs had told uh, the guildmaster that, you know, if you persevere, you'd be able to get them out of there. And after that, the guildmaster and his friends kind of chased them out and called them a heathen and all that kind of stuff. But it was a pretty cool event. I mean, when it ended, we were pretty uh, ecstatic. We had all this, there's everything on the site about it. And we said, hey, we did it. And since then, we've been our own events because there hasn't really been anything else with Cove lately. I mean, they had the, uh, well, this, this I guess was only on Europa. I'm sorry. Um, that wasn't... We had a lot of, we had a big orc invasion on Europa, but um, yeah, we pretty much do our own thing. We with the town so we have to do everything ourselves because we don't really have the M's doing much with Cove. Cove is, Cove is a very small town. There's not even any stables or anything in Cove. I mean, we do um, everything's manual. I mean, it's it's an accomplishment what, what the guildmaster's done. I can't believe how organized it is right now. And it's just we have our town. We have uh, the 
we have our barracks and we have uh I think we have our civil system, but yeah, you you guys can go ahead now. <laughs> Thanks, Kendall. Um Yeah, no, 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 you're right. And um, you know, I've been part of many player run towns in the past. Um, you know, on some um Pacific I can't even remember what the name of the town was, that's that's pretty bad, but that was many years ago. On Sonoma, uh, Darkmoor. Um, I've been a member of THB, which is build towns in various areas. Um, on Siege, um, Iron Town is a is a very big you know player run town. Wintermore is another one. The Knights, Knights of the Silver Serpent, and um, yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And I see what you're talking about. When you have your own town, and this has been brought up in the past by um, people. Begging the developers, give us the ability to put, you know, a staple in our town. Um, I think a bank might overpower a player-run town a little bit. Um, So I'm a little edgy there. But a stable would be nice. Um, You know, just various NPC vendors. This would also help with those who run red um, characters or red guilds or PK guilds or PvP guilds where it's majority red who cannot go into a town, a government-run town, for example. I can't run in. My, character's, my character is red. I go into a, into a character town. I can't buy booze for my bar. Okay? So I have to have a second character that's blue to go in and get booze for my bar or a friend who's blue to go in and get booze for my bar. Um, having a player-run town and the ability to put something in there that I can actually buy from as a red character... You know, it's an outcast town, so why shouldn't we be able to hire our own red vendors, NPCs? But anyways, I don't want to take too much time away from Winfield, because I know he's been waiting patiently, too. So go ahead, Mayor. Go ahead and uh, tell us what you have to think about all this. Okay. The um, Yeah, I've had a lot of ideas on Townstone and went to one of the UO events uh, gatherings quite a few years ago uh, when we talked about that quite a bit. The um, kind of have to think about what makes a uh, player-run location, a city. And usually it starts with, let's say, five to ten buildings in a within a radius that they're all part of that same community. Right now, uh, just like Kendall said, we put together things uh, basically offline or use our own mechanics to identify that that particular area, player town. Uh, we change the house signs to all of a similar uh, color, we put, in our case, we put Pax Lair or Pax Oku on those particular signs. And um, what I think that developers could possibly do to kickstart a town stone idea is start it out very simply. One is just figure out the mechanics of how to establish a town stone. Does it take five buildings within a certain radius? If that's the case, then somebody... Uh, can lay down a town stone in the center of that radius or in a location within that radius. And the first thing would be simply just have the stone list which buildings are connected to that stone. A second phase would be which guilds are connected to that stone. Uh, And a third piece that could be simply put on perhaps is the charter of the town. And then because so much information about the town is based on websites, would be the URL address of the, uh, the Player Town's website. After that kind of level of mechanics is done, which doesn't affect PvP, doesn't affect protection, things like that, those could be future phases once the basic elements of a town stone are put in place. Well said. Yeah, no, that, that's a, uh, awesome ideas. And uh, I've actually envisioned the same thing myself. And I'm sure a lot of people who have ever had anything to do with a player run town, whether you were just a, a contributor or a leader in one, um, is to have a central location, a town hall, uh, a, a city square where your town stone is. Uh, the town stone, in my vision, was um, sort of a hierarchy above the guild system. The guilds would link to a town, either to defend it or whatever, or allegiance to it, however it works. But um, it, uh, but I'm but I always think in a role playing mind thought of mind. So by the time it gets down to the developers, I'm sure it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, Vice Roy, you've been waiting a while too, and I appreciate your patience. Go ahead. 
Um, what I was actually thinking, and I've actually played uh, several different MMOs uh, over the uh, course of the last eight years in which I've been playing Ultima Online, and one that I think that comes closest to what I'm kind of describing for anybody out there who's ever played the game called Shadowbane, uh, you'll probably know how uh, how that system is set up w with regards to setting up a town or whatever. You basically plant a tree, and it's called the Tree of Life over in there in that game. But in this case, it would be the towns, the uh, the town stone and everything, and then you have a radius and everything. And and what was so neat about that game and everything is that you could actually go to the website at Shadowbane's website and actually see uh, the whole world, and you could see where all these different uh, towns were at on that world map. Uh, and I would have to give you an example. I have to look up for um, look around for it a little bit, but. I, I, I want to put that out in the IRC channel so you guys have a better idea as to what Ultima Line could very well be in the future should the uh, developers uh, buy into something like this. That's a good idea. I agree. Um, I'll be the first to admit that I don't really go look at other um, game or company or game company websites very often. I should. Um, other than Sony, I'm there once in a while because I kind of got interested in Star Wars Galaxies for a little bit. Um, but I do hear people all the time tell me, hey, have you seen what, like what you're talking about? A, f a whole map of an entire shard, or well, what we call a shard, the whole lands or whatever. And you know, you'd be able to basically pinpoint on, hey, here's where this is at. And this is where... I don't know about the rest of you... But if you're like me, every once in a while, you have no choice but to pull out that cloth map and, pull, and figure out where the heck something is. Um, in any case, uh, Kendall, I know you, you shut your mic off, but go ahead and, uh, if, you, if you still wanted to say something, um, go ahead and, and uh, do so. Well, what I was saying before is that uh, Townstones, I mean, that's a really good idea. I really love that idea. I mean, I know we've had a few attempts in our guild to make uh, uh, sub-guilds where we include a, a, a guild of nearby orcs. You have a, near Koba is a little orc fort. And to um, to create another guild connect, connected to this Cove town, uh, we could have our, our, our thieves guild or we could have an orc guild. That would be really great. I mean, it really, I mean, right now we just kind of, if you want to be an orc, you kind of just dress up in green and you want to be But uh, if we, it was clearly labeled that way, if we have this orc guild and then a thief guild, that would be really uh if it was really clearly, clearly defined and we don't have to worry about um, people not being very well informed or uh, having to worry about organization, I really like that. But as far as um, zones go, town zones, um, it might be a little bit difficult with uh, the EO interface. It may, it may involve a huge expansion. But I know, for example, right now all the, all the guilds in uh, Europa are basically town-based. There's a Cove guild and a EO guild and a Trinsic guild. But there's also a a guild in Trinsic Swamps called Kaldor, and uh, they're not based in any town. They have their own player-run town. I think I'm not really that well informed about Kaldor, but uh, they don't live in any town. They have their own zone that they created, and uh, they're actually a very decent guild, as far as I know. But uh, yeah, you can go ahead, Winfield. Yeah, that, that's good points you make there, Kendall. Um, the zones kind of spook me. I don't like the word zone, only because I I hate the word guard zone. <laughs> In my opinion, guard zones would vanish if I had, if 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 uh, Mr. Tact would let me be a developer for the day, everybody would be freely attackable. But that's my own personal opinion. I'm not pushing that on anybody. Uh, so the yeah, the idea of town zones is a little creepy. Um, not a bad idea because it could be it could be sketched out another way. Um, but yeah, no, I'm just kind of paranoid about the word zone. Anyways, uh, yeah, uh, Mayor Winfield, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think once a, uh, a location is set up, whether it be a guild hall or people call home, or whether it be a player town or people call home, I think the uh, kind of that helps establish a basis for role playing in a given area. You know when people are going to be around. You know basically where to find them, where they're going to hang out, where they're going to meet up for an adventure. But also, as you go into trying to keep people organized. Uh, it's actually role playing. You know, I am a role played mayor of a community. Uh, we have viceroys of different cities, and they have to role play and actually conduct real life leadership 
to effectively manage uh, or lead an area and give people uh, and help motivate people to role play or to just simply go out and and uh, adventure or PK or whatever the interest of that particular city is. So part of the role playing once areas are established, which is just basically a foundation to help launch role playing ideas and people working together. I think the next step, and many guilds do this, they have their guild masters, they have their leaders, they have their captains, and role playing everybody, you're role playing a leadership position, and that's another step towards basically going beyond the game than just going out with three or four people and killing monsters or killing other people. Yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely. I agree. Um, Sarah Swift um, said uh, something interesting um, in the IRC chat. Um, call them uh, regions instead of zones. Um, the only thing that I, I don't like about the zone or a region or a boundary of any sort is that eventually, and uh, as role players, you and um, well, Kai doesn't even be ha- take being a role player. All of us here on the panel will know, will say the first thing somebody's going to ask for is, "I want the ability to call the guards." You know it's going to happen, and that's what I'm scared to death of. Um, I do like all of the ideas we've heard today so far. I do. I I, I think um, player run towns need some recognition. They have for a very very long time. Um, uh, Mary, if I'm not mistaken, I understand that it didn't, um, at one point, um, didn't at least one building in your town got blessed, didn't it? I know a uh, door over on Sonoma has the YMC blessed. That was a give me. Um, in any case, I'm just curious, you know, we do, we do, the, the player run towns need some love. If the, if the player run towns got some love, I think we would see role playing just thrive on UO. But in any case, uh, Kendall, go ahead. Regions or zones, I think, change the name of whatever you want to call it, the area zone or whatever, it's not going to change what it is. I don't think there should be any zones attached to it because eventually, you know, there'll be all the, there'll be t- zones all over and I, I don't know, it just seems, I mean, if you create, it, maybe somebody will come and greet you, they'll have a townstone like right next to your town and that way you can't put a guild stone there, or uh, townstone. But it'd be nice to have a townstone maybe issued. Well, charges maybe this should be really expensive. But there should be only certain people who can buy townstones. I mean, if everybody buys a townstone, they can all have different towns like all over the place. And that's why I don't like regions, though. I mean, if you make regions, and maybe it's just too, too too limited. And it's really in the, how do you, how do you define a region? But um, I forgot what I was going with this actually. Uh, you can go ahead. I can't forget what I was going to say. Well, I was just going to say, um, this is the second time Sarah Swift, she has had a great idea as well, just to comment on that. Um, uh, instead of when you call guards in a player run down, what would be a greater idea than everybody who's in the guild attached to the stone, the town stone, that could be multiple guilds, gets a, no- a notification on their screen, just like when the server's going down or whatever, the town is attacked or whatever, instead of an instant guard whack. That would be, I love that idea. Man, Sarah, if you do not write that up and post that in the dev forum, I'm going to pe- I'm going to come and just train for two weeks just to PK you on your shard. In any case, <laughs> Vice Ray, go ahead. Well, you know, I just wanted to put out there that, you know, I put up a little image as to how Shadowbane does their little system of, you know, player run towns and everything. And if you go to yourradio.com slash images slash web, Slash uh, Shadowbane dot JPEG. Uh, you'll also you'll see a little map of this and everything of how they do it. And to answer your question, uh, Kendall, about uh, you know what would players just go out there and create a town and forget about it and not really take care of it or do anything with it? Well, the thing about in Shadowbane, whenever you create a town and everything, you would have to upkeep it. You know, you would have to keep up with it, uh, maintenance and stuff like that. You would have to constantly keep putting money and resources into the townstone, or the tree of life in this case, to keep the town alive and going. I mean, without constant resources going into it, you know, every so often, then your tree of life would lose, uh, you know, uh, lose a, uh, you know, a health bar or whatever. And when that tree of life lost all its health bars, you know, the town died out. 
But, you know, uh, as your tree grew or your town stone grew, and, you know, in, in bars, you could actually gr- uh, expand your radius, your town's influence and everything. And that's that was what they did with Shadowbane and everything. And I think that was a great concept because that would also be a gold sink for the game, but, you know, and actually get people to participate and take part in taking care of the town and stuff like that. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. And, you know, I think I, based on what you're talking about, it makes me feel kind of bad because I should go out and look at other sites, um, being that I'm so uh, biased um, in my gameplay. Uh, UO is pretty much the only multiplayer game other than the old MUDs that I used to play way back in the day. Um, anyways, uh, go ahead and Kendall. Uh, I know you had another thought. I don't really like the idea, though, of having to support your townstone. I mean, for example, they had the uh, the zoo quests and things like that. They required a massive amount of money and pets you put into that kind of thing to even get to the first tier. And it, it's just like it was through too much effort. But um, if maybe if a guild, maybe your townstone, would require a certain amount of people, like a guild for over a guild of over 100 people, would be able to get a guild stone. But I don't like the idea of having to maintain it. I mean. It's not that it's not a good idea, but it's about what you what I expect from UO uh, in general. I don't want to have to, you know, have to go out and, you know, kill all the animals or to get so much money to put into the townson every day. It's we we're more focused on not the mechanical aspect. We're more focused on the, the gameplay. We're more focused on the role playing, not the the oh, so you have to worry about that kind of stuff. We want to have fun. We don't have to worry about that kind of thing. We want to worry about uh, what the thief what the thief around town has been doing or. Uh, what the enemy guild has been up to, whether they're going to go to war or not. We're not worried about all the little details of keeping, you know, keeping track of the guild. I mean, we, that is a big part of role playing is uh, contributing to your town, but that's not the only part there is. We're worried about interaction. I mean, that's our, what's our archival to worry about is uh, interaction between people. I guess it has to be because it has any mechanical uh, uh, structure. But I just really like the mechanical aspect of having to contribute on an on out of out of character basis to have to maintain the skill by contributing things you have to go out and get I guess you can sort of host events though to get the kind of thing I guess we can work around it but I worry that it might be you all might exaggerate it too much we might have to put way too much into it than we want to I agree with you there um you know, we look at the zoo system and the library system right now that's in place since ML came out, and um, you see people that are, you know, they're pushing, come on, people, we need to get more animals, we need to get more, you know, we need to feed them, we need to get more library donations, that sort of thing. They're getting some really cool rewards for it, but for those of us who don't play 24-7 or don't have the resources to invest in doing that sort of thing, um, if you implement that into a player run town where I see it going is you're going to have a bunch of people who play a lot and then you're going to have the casual players who enjoy playing on the weekends or a couple hours a night um, and I, I agree with you I see EA going into overkill on it because next thing you know you're going to have a hierarchy system on that on that stone well this person contributed this month this much this month they're at this level they may even get a title you know maybe I'm looking a little too far forward to something that's never even been discussed before but looking backwards at our guild system and our faction system yeah I can see that happening real quick and a lot of people being upset um, Mayor Winfield you were next go ahead yeah you, you asked the question of um, if Pax Lair in the old days on Fluka had any blessed or customized buildings um, enhanced by the IGMs back in those days? And the answer is yes. We have, we still have about six or eight buildings in the uh, Paxlair Fluka location. And I put a, an address link up to paxlair.com slash maps, M-A-P-S, uh, that uh, shows that town. Basically what happened was early, you know, from uh, six months into the game when it first started, we just started getting a bunch of people in one location, start setting up a bunch of buildings. Well, some of the IGMs took notice of that. Uh, the Sears took notice of that. And basically they put in the equivalent of a townstone, not mechanical, but some features outside the area that gave people a sense that this was a, a player city. Now, over time, 
they had to stop doing that uh, for whatever the reasons were. A lot of other towns at that time built themselves up uh, all, all of us kind of simultaneously uh, throughout uh, Feluca Chesapeake and uh, some towns got the blessings some didn't and that is one major reason probably why they stopped doing that uh, because it was so hard to determine deterministically when a town needed something uh, enhanced and when it didn't uh, so all those features are still there they're legacy features but basically uh, in the future players ought to be able to create those things uh, outside their facilities, outside their buildings through a townstone mechanism. But, th but again, that only sets a foundation where people can come together and role play or feel like part of a, part of a larger community with a, a government structure. However, the, the, and I would say the government structure needs to be defined pretty much out of game by the players, not mechanically defined by who gave X number of resources, uh, because, to be honest, I don't have much gold in the game. I'm a diplomat, and I just try to help lead people, and I don't get any gold for that to, uh, to put on a stone that says, uh, you know, I should be mayor of the town. Good point. Um, very good point. Um, yeah, no, the blessings, that, that's a... Yeah. That's a, that's a whole discussion in all of its own. Um, you know, whether it's a whole building blessing or um, item blessings, EM gifts, or rewards, I suppose we could call them. Um, you know, if you get one, somebody goes out and puts a little log cabin out in the middle of nowhere and says, hey, this is this is, should be blessed, and I don't see why this is any less of a reason to be blessed than this town that's been here for five years. You know, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I can see where you run into that problem. We don't see very many blessings anymore or tributes or anything like that. Uh, Vice Ray, go ahead. Well, you know, uh, as um, Kendall was uh, pointing out earlier and everything, um, yes, it would become a little pain in the butt, you know, to go out and collect resources and stuff and have to dump gold into maintaining your city or your play around town and, you know, resources to keep it and stuff. But in real life, you know, that's the, that's the same case. I mean, even in feudal governments, I mean, that's what supported a government or a play around town or any establishment. I mean, that's always been the basis for any type of government or any type of township through all its years, taxes. And uh, I think that's something that has to be um, in there. Otherwise, we're going to have the problem of everyone having one of these towns, and then that takes away from the meaning, uh, the uh, the uh, the special meaning of a town. Because if every if everyone's got one, like a guild, then what's the point of even having a player run town if everybody's going to have one? It shouldn't be anything that's easy to obtain or anything easy to maintain or anything of that nature. And besides, a a town is not just run by a guild. It's run by, I mean, there could be multiple guilds in a town. And that's the difference, you know. And that's where, you know, that, you know, would, uh, I guess, would occur. Uh, but anyways, go back, go, uh, I'll give it back to you, Spider. You make a good point. Can you imagine, though, if every single house was a player-run town because it was so much easier to stable your pet at home? I would be scared to death as a red character. Uh, well, maybe, okay, I'll take that back. Uh, it has nothing to do with red versus blue. Any character running past a house with a stable connected to it, because it was a player-run town, even though there's a player-run town one square away next to him, or four squares, I guess you have to be, um, and having a bunch of uh, room beetles come launching out at you, it gives house a uh, house hiding a whole new name, or house fighting, rather. Um, that was the first thought that came to my mind when you said that. Yeah, there have to be... You know, maybe a population. Um, you know, if EA wants to sell more accounts and somebody is dead on play, uh, playing solo but wants to have their own town so they can sit there and house hide with their beetles in, a, in, in their own stable or, or something like that, that's just an example. Um, by all means, go buy more accounts. Or on the production shards, you have no choice. You have six characters anyways, but maybe it should be per account. You know, there's so many accounts in a single town. I don't know. Um, Kendall, go ahead. That is interesting. I don't know how they would uh, figure out how to make towns other than being totally abused. I know that 
maybe it has to do with the guild population or maybe several guild, several guild members coming together and applying for this kind of thing. Man, they had some sort of order. You can't just go up to a, a GM and say, hey, we want a town stone, because that might, you know, might play favoritism, favoritism like uh, Benfield was talking about with the blessings, but it has something, it has something concrete about how they can get a town stone. I'm not sure how that would, how that would happen. I guess it's up to EA how to figure that one out. <laughs> but, um, when it comes to realism, however, I know you're coming from Vice Ray, and I, I understand, but I have this, personally, I have this big problem before with how people will role play different characters. There will be draw, draw role players, and there will be, uh, vampires and undead, and they would all role play them differently, and since it wouldn't be quite realistic to me, you know, it would drive me nuts. People play a draw, and they'd be all, you know, frilly and happy, I mean, that's not how draw are, but, and I, I worried about that. I actually posted, posted a big form of it. I posted a big essay. I'm sorry, I'm talking way too fast. But I posted a huge essay on a form about how I don't like how people role play, role play draw very often. And I got all different responses. I got a lot of them saying, "Hey, you're right. This is really unrealistic." And I got people saying that, um, "Hey, I don't do. I don't criticize how you role play. We do role play the way we want to. It's not. This is not life. It's a game. It's a game. You play a game to have fun. You don't play it." to uh, enjoy a realistic experience. You play it to just, to, you know, have fun. And we both play the way we want to. It's like, you know, that, you have a really good point there. I mean, it's, not, it's still, it's still revenue. That's the way people will play people. But it, it's not about realism. It's about how you want to do things. I mean, I can see having to maintain a guild, and that would be realistic. And people, some people might appreciate that. I think the majority of people, majority of people, might, the majority of people might be able to, uh, would enjoy more if it was more simple. And if it was not so much the basis of what role-playing guilds are, that's not what we're playing guilds are. Like I was saying before, this is not what we're playing guilds are. It's not what, what how you maintain a town. It's about how you... It's not, the town's not the basis. The town is it's interaction. It's what we're worried about. It's how what's happening. The stories and everything. That, that's what we're worried about. When having to maintain a guild, we'll have to be... Having to maintain a guild, would you'd have to go out of your way to do other things. and You'd take away from the story and the role play of the community. And having to be realistic, I think it would just make it more complicated. And like I said, it's a game. We're trying to have fun. It's not about... You know, it's not a simulation life, even though some people like it to be. It's a game. You play it to have fun. Good points, Kendall. Um, I say that a lot because you guys are making a lot of good points today. Um, I wouldn't say that if I didn't think so. Believe me, I'd come back with an argument. Um, on, on, on what you're saying, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, basically, in the overall look, uh, in the overall looking down the road on how I think things should go um, and this is my opinion because EA is not going to listen to what I have to say it's going to listen to what everybody has to say collectively um, we, um, I, the player run towns are the heart of an RP environment in my opinion um, regardless if it's a single guild house or if it's numerous houses or if it's you know 20 or 30 houses like it is in Iron Town over on Siege Perilous you've got a community and that's the heart of the guild. In any case, um, what I wanted to do is uh, get on to the next subject real quick. It, we're, we're basically we're still going on with RP. Uh, trust me on that one. Um, the item properties. How do you guys, as guilds, Kendall, Winfield, our listeners, uh, whoever, item properties is a huge thing with me. Um, I am an AOS. Um, I'm AOS challenged. I'm horrible with it. I, 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 I hate... I've gotten to the point where, in the middle of a fight, when I die, I go home. When I resuit, I grab anything in my armor box and throw it on, along with the crappiest weapon, and uh, run back into battle. Die, come back, do the same thing, because I got so tired of sitting there doing the math. So, as from an RP standpoint... As far as armor goes, um, do you guys look forward to doing the, you know, do you pretend, do you look, still look for the item properties um, from an RP standpoint? Or do you just say, you must carry Viking swords, or you must do this? What do you guys, what do you guys do um, in your guilds? And, um, you know, I know like the orcs on Siege, you know, they own, they refuse to use magic, um, you know, on and on. That sort of thing. Um, I'm just curious, and uh, I think this is a good good discussion. So, um, Vice Ray, you were first. Go ahead. Yes, you know, uh, I was uh, speaking with uh, various different people last night about how do they do uh, things on their shard with regards to RP. I know some shards 
you know, they pretty much do um, things where they have a requirement that you cannot, um, for example, I think Baron Ship of Cove uh, on, on Europa and everything. They uh, allow no magic items and uh, no runic items. I, I, I'm not quite sure on that one. But I'm sure Kendall can help us along with that one out l later uh, if I'm wrong or whatever. But I'm also I'm also looking at how they dress up and everything. They dress up in shadow armor and stuff like that, uh, or dark uh, armor and stuff. But you know the the drawback to that is you have to wonder, you know, um, whether or not you know, because there is disadvantages to wearing um, shadow armor, and the disadvantage to wearing the shadow armor is that you're really vulnerable to cold resist in those regards and everything. So. You know, while you try to roleplay outside the aspect of item properties, I don't think it can be avoided. And I think that's a hindrance to roleplaying because you can't just simply ignore it because it's a real, you know, fact that it's there because you're going to get your butt whooped every time you get into, you know, a RP battle or whatever and they have cold weapons or whatever else equipped. You're just going to get slaughtered and cut down like nothing. And I don't think it's quite fair to the roleplayers in that regard. Uh, also, you have uh, some uh, guilds that uh, do not allow Bushido uh, and ninja skills and stuff like that, and which I think is quite cool. I mean, there's a lot of concepts that I liked about uh, many of the different guilds I spoke with that do uh, role playing. However, uh, one thing I did, you know, because I was about to be honest, I was about to jump over heads over heel last night about possibly joining the Bearship Cove, but when I started hearing like things like, you know item properties, you know, still being a factor, I was like, well, you know, I was thinking I was going to get away from it all, and then I got a little reality in it that it's still a factor, believe it or not, um, but, you know, it's, I'll let her finish up the rest uh, later. Uh, go ahead, uh, Spider. Uh, Mayor Winfield, you were next, go ahead. As far as uh, items, item properties, things like that. You muted yourself. I'm sorry. Uh, I would say that um, it all depends on what the the guild, the group, wants to do. If they're a role playing, if they're a bunch of orcs, certainly they're going to wear orc masks. They're going to wear orc kind of armor. Uh, if they choose to do that, yeah, they can probably be three of them can probably be wiped out by one guy who is fully equipped as an enemy. So one of the challenges in role playing is you may need 15 orcs to go against five you know, high-class players who have all of the items they need uh, for the highest stats. So that's part of role-playing as well. You might have a, like an orcish guild that's basically in role-playing very poor and they have to uh, scavenge through the, through the area for their regents. They can't, you know, maybe they don't go to towns and buy from mages. They get their shinies, you know, two or three at a time, whatever. So it's really up to the guild how pure and realistic they want to role play it and then they just need the numbers to try to do that and I bet they have a lot of fun doing it that's a good point um, the only thing that I would add to that is that I know and it's not just on Siege it's happened on a couple of other shards where the orcs were basically run off the shard altogether or out of UO because of that you know they, granted they couldn't they might not be able to get the numbers or or they had the numbers but then the people with um, all the Uber items would come and just slaughter them because they had more than people too with the increase in UO subscriptions at the time. So it was, um, you know, it's sad because the, the, the orcs who did want, didn't want to do anything more than just play an orc um, were slaughtered. Like, I, you know, I, I don't even want to go in the racial in issues or analogies towards the Indians and stuff like that, but they were chased. They were gone. They were, they're, they're, playing WoW or whatever because they just gave up because they wanted to play a native orc. And it was kind of sad. And I, I mean, I never witnessed it on Siege. I came over to Siege after that happened. Um, but I heard a lot about it. And I saw it happen on Pacific. I think the orcs were chased off there as well. Uh, they may be back, and I know they're coming back to Siege. In any case, I want to go on. Let, go ahead, Kendall. No, I like that. I mean... The different orc guilds, and what you're saying about the item properties, I know that Ricer had a big problem with that. And what uh, Wendy was saying about um, orcs getting lesser armor, having to wear the orc, orc mask, which is a very poor, pretty poor resist. But um, when it comes to item properties, 
I think you might be exaggerating a little bit about how much of an advantage you have. I mean, this is not like, you know, wearing a as compared to runic armor. I mean, there could be a huge difference, and there could be, you know, it might be one hit kill, something like that. But when it comes to adding properties about uh, different reasons, it's really that much difference. I mean, you have an advantage uh, individually, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win. It's all about talents, it's about what, what weapons you use, what attacks you use, what spells you use. It has nothing to do with the armor. I mean, it has very little to do with the armor. There's very little, it's not that much of a difference that you might think it is. But uh, there is a guild in Europa called the uh, UDs for Undead, and they all play um, undead characters. And they don't wear a different armor, they wear uh, all bone armor, which makes them look more skeletal. But that armor, is, that armor also is very poor resist. I mean, it's known for that. I mean, you wear the skull and you wear the the different uh, armor parts, and that's pretty poor reasons, but they do really well. I mean, they use different uh, skills that we don't. They, uh, I think they have necromancy, and we don't allow that in our guild, because, you know, it's, it's not really themed with our guild, but they're surprisingly strong. I mean, I was, today I was in a, uh, walking by, and I got killed by a couple uh, UD walking by, but it's not of a, the armor isn't really, doesn't really play a big issue, and the thing is about, uh, the orc armor, I like that because it's themed. I mean, maybe orcs can't really get that good armor because they don't have any smiths. They have to steal other armor. Um, but that's like that's like a thing over that part. Uh, yeah, you guys can go ahead. Good point. Um, you know, for those who know me, uh, I play a vampire in, in game. Um, and uh, yeah, we. Um, armor up, I'm sorry, but vampires are basically just humans that are dead, so <laughs> we armor up big time. Um, I don't look at the mods on things, and if anything, uh, we go and we break out the next uh, 5k deed for f horned armor that we have, and beg our favorite crafter to, to suit us up with as many suits as she can get out of it, because we blow through so much so quickly, but you're right. Um, you know, as far as undead walking around we have a uh, lich over on siege which is coming back finally and they play they play liches and they play it well Rikus is the GM over there and I mean it is cutthroat hardcore RP um, I think the only exception was when ghost of siege in the old lich before it came back again came out in the middle of nowhere and said snap cackle and pop <laughs> which was pretty good in any case um, no th th those are those are really good points um, I think Viceroy was next unless I'm mistaken correct me Viceroy go ahead uh, well I, actually I think Winfield was next yeah go ahead Winfield then I think on the uh, the items that uh, like orcs would wear and things like that there was one potential mechanical way that the designers could could help us in this regard. You take a and, and another thing is that GM blacksmiths are, you know, basically not useful that much anymore because everybody can repair their own weapons and things like that. So have a GM blacksmith be able to reshape an armor item, you know, a special shield or something. Make maybe wants to turn it into a, a wooden shield so it looks better for an orc. Reshape it but it takes the exact same qualities of the original item that the orc gave to the GM blacksmith to reshape. Ooh, you just reminded me of a very great idea. Yes, that has been brought up many times, especially uh, for us over on Siege. Um, you know, our, our uniform is the samurai helm and the legs of embers because they're blessed. And we only get one uh, blessed item that we can move around. Usually it's our weapon. So everybody's stuck with what we call bunny ears and duck feet, unless you get them dyed. And that has been brought up many times where take a blacksmith, make them useful again. Let them reshape that. You're right. Make it a normal helm. Make it an orc mask. Make it a tribal mask. But retain the same quality so that the role players can play what they want without running around with their antennas on their head, like um, my favorite Martian. Around um, around the game, um, that that is brilliant, to be honest. Uh, really, because right now you're right. Um, with um, I've never looked at plate mail uh, in the last year, even though 
plate mail is my favorite armor in the game. What's the point when I can buy, um, you know, horned or, or, or spined or whatever leather I need for the same price or less or farm it easier? There's no point to it. Um, bring our blacksmiths back. I agree 100%. Take them stupid repair deeds out of the game or charge a fortune more for them. I think all blacksmiths should charge 1000 per deed because that is wrong. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, you know, basically going back to, you know, some of the uh, things that I had a problem with over on Europa, you know, like I said, I had a great deal of interest thinking I was going to get over there and get away basically from uh, item properties. Well, you know, for example, if you take Baron Ship of Cove, I think some of their rules are that you cannot loot other people when you kill them or slay them. And you can only, like, take 200 gold or something of that nature and whatever bandages and potions and stuff like that. That's what I gathered. Uh, however, what, what I also asked is, well, you know, why would, why would you not be able to loot, you know, items and stuff from other people and stuff like that? And what I, what it really came down to is that people, even though they're limited to just G, uh, GM crafted weapons and everything, they're taking those GM craft, crafted weapons and basically, uh, decking them out with the best properties. So, you know, like, it's kind of like the way we do the artifact system, but it's it's in that category. You know, you go with the best uh, resist, you go with the best damage output under that category. So everything under uh, GM related and everything, you're going with the best, you know, damage output, the best, uh, you know, resist and everything rather than ignoring it. So, I mean, yes, there's no way to get around that or whatever, but, you know, at the same time, I don't see why you would uh, want to give your enemy or anybody this the opportunity to focus on purely you know item properties when it comes to stuff like that when it comes to battles because I mean the way I see it, if you want to hurt your enemy you take away their good weapons and then they they can no longer just simply focus and then they'll take away the whole focus of focusing on item properties I mean when when I think players in a role playing as atmosphere focus on item properties. I really think that really hurts uh, role-playing in a great deal. So, I guess what I want to find out from the listeners out there who are tuning in and everything, do you think item properties hurt role-playing to some degree? And if so, I want to hear it, you know, because I, 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 me personally, I don't think item properties should be anywhere in role-playing. That's me personally, though. But go ahead, Spider. No, I agree with you, Vice. Um, um, any sort of properties, blessings, any of it. You know, that you, hindsight is twenty twenty. Unfortunately, we have de developers who are, um, you know, past and present. You know, they, what, what can you do? You look back, people got used to all of that. And that's, that's where the problem is at. Where do you find the happy medium? Uh, go ahead, and Kendall. Let's hear what you have to say. Well, I was worried about what Viceroy was saying about uh, worrying about other properties too much. And uh, I might have exaggerated a bit when I was talking about that, but it's not really a big deal in our guild. I mean, I can remember one guy who made a huge deal about it, and uh, he was also kind of a gung-ho guy who didn't like to lose at all. But um, he also played a mage that was grossly overpowered because he knew how to use his skills, but he's the only guy I know that actually was so obsessed with item properties, but he's, uh, he's not the entire guild. Our entire guild is basically... We're talking about community. We're, we're more of a... When it comes to our guild, we're not worried about item properties. When it comes to fighting, we're worried about uh, how we work together and um, how, how our healing is going and how what attack we're using, what, what techniques we're going to use. We're not worried about the armor at all. I mean, a person or two might be, but it's not an, it's not an end mass thing. It's something you worry about individually. I mean, if you want to, do it, if you want to have your own properties, you can. And uh, about looting, however, you're talking about you don't like to... You think looting is, um, not looting is unrealistic, but there's more to that, there's more to realism than there is to um, gameplay. I mean, if somebody eludes you, you're going to hold it against them. And if they, I mean, it might, it might even cause a grudge. I mean, if they, if, you, if they kill you and they loot things off you, you might kill them later and loot things off them. And it's just too much effort to have to have the guildmasters manage that kind of thing. I mean... If we have to worry about these little petty conflicts within our guild, we're just going to worry about, we're going to waste time that we could use in something else. And we want to create, or more about morale. We're not worried about what items we have or what, uh, 
what we're losing and what we're gaining. We're, we're not about morale. We, we, we beat these guys. We're, we're successful. We won. Or we lost. We've got to work together. We've got to do something better. We've got to uh, improve our technique. But I think property is not such a big deal in our guild. I mean, or it isn't. I know there's a guild in uh, Europa that is not worried about them at all. They don't even allow you to be worried about them. They supply your outfits. They don't, they don't let you make them at all. And they use uh, all GM armor. I mean, it's not um, runic or anything. It's not magic. It's they got no extra stats. It's just uh, GM made. I think, it's, I think in that guild, they don't, they don't even allow power scrolls at all. So you have pretty centered armor in that guild. And they still do surprisingly well. They've been around for like seven years. And I've been impressed by them. They've gone through different leaders, but uh, they're not so obsessed with item properties. Maybe just fine. And so do we. We, we we're just fine, too. We, um, we're a younger guild, and uh, we don't have a big issue with item properties. We don't have a lot of complaints, either, about who who has better armor. We do have complaints, however, some people, some people say, he's using magic armor. Now, that's a big issue, but we don't use... Uh, we try to make a resist even. I mean, personally, I try to make my resist, you know, 60, 40, 40, 40, but um, if you want to change your resist, if you worry about it at all, you can uh, change them, but it's not really a big deal. I mean, no one really cares about them, really. It's just what one guy I'm talking about, and a couple of other people maybe, but it's not really an issue you focus on. So if you want to escape from that kind of thing, it's not like it's going to be a big issue. It's not like anyone's going to care. I mean, um, a, lot of, a lot of guilds we war against are also not really worried about that kind of thing. Uh, seems a lot to say with that thing. <laughs> Very good point. Um, me, you, I, come in, Kendall. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the properties are in the game. Um, on Siege, they're huge right now. Um, mostly because, um, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the player base doesn't role play, so it's basically I must win at all costs kind of attitude. Not with everybody. But in general, you know, for me, um, I'll probably die at all costs is my attitude as I go out. <laughs> and I, I re-equip, so I, I do use GM armor or um, weapons that I've found or bought off of vendors um, on my limited income. Um, and I don't have time to loot. When I'm in a, when I'm in a battle, I'm going to be dead as soon as I kill somebody because I'm up throwing my headset off and doing the happy dance around the room then coming back to a gray screen because I did the happy dance. So, um, coming from a really bad PK, or a PvP or rather, um, yeah, that I, I see where you're coming from. And, um, yeah, every guild's different. We'll see. Uh, Vice Ray, go ahead. Well, you know, just to basically summarize up my whole argument was is that, you know, I don't don't really like the RP in aspects where they are pretty much against looting of other corpses and stuff because what I believe firmly in is that whenever you take you remove that restriction you rob people of their uh, ability to focus on item properties because I mean then people are more cautious and then you're let's just say for example if people are cautious about well you know I got this really good suit that was GM crafted and I did follow all the other guidelines but I'm going to focus on item properties and I'm going to pay 500k for the suit so I can have it you know dyed let's say a Baylorite suit so I can have it dyed a particular color so I can uh, conform to outfits and uniforms and stuff like that well then you have this pretty good suit in, in whenever you're going up against somebody else but I, I just believe that whenever you you uh, remove that restriction you're pretty much robbing the opponents or everybody in the whole scene of role playing of the opportunity to focus on item properties and by taking that out you, you don't have that problem ever later down the road that's 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 pretty much my whole argument on that well the way I look at it um, if there's a problem between uh, looting and item properties try and loot them all you solved the issue right there. I'm not. I'm not a fan of dry looting, but if there is going to be an issue between, oh no, you're, you're looking for better armor off to your victim, that sort of thing. Dry loot them. Everybody dry loots. That way, there's no uh, argument as to, oh, he took my best piece of armor or he took that. And they're not supposed to do that. Dry loot everybody. Why not? Um, that's pretty much the way it works on siege for a lot of guilds. Most people won't. They'll just kind of pick. At it, I don't have the time. Like I said earlier, if I tried to dry loot somebody, I'm dead before I got the second piece of uh, 
you know, the second re- the necro region off of them before I'm dead. Um, but anyways, go ahead, Winfield. Let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, I um, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, other aspects of role-playing than just the mechanics, getting ab- able to suit up, have the right characteristics and things like that. More of, more of what I've been focusing on is the realism of players acting out their characters inside inside the game. Consistency of those actions. For example, in Pax Lair Feluca on Chesapeake, uh, we would at times have PKs come in and go ahead and annihilate us in town. Two days later, they come in and they're our friends. Next day, they're killing us. So there's there's consistency of actions that really leads to uh, robust role playing and less confusion in the game. When you see that character, you know he's an enemy. You don't have to wonder if uh, if they're an enemy today and a friend uh, the next day. So one thing I'd like to to toss out is the uh, the realism aspect, the consistency of actions within the game of people using their characters in in environments. Um, the spontaneity of reacting to those actions. If somebody attacks me in Paxlair, I'll call in the guards, and that guy's an, a criminal of Paxlair, and he's going to be a criminal for what? A week, two weeks, a month? You know, we have memory in the role-playing realm, uh, whereas mechanics, you know, they they're not gray in two minutes. So the role-playing realm is a little bit different, um, going well beyond the mechanics. And the other aspect of things is the fiction behind you know what is your character's history what does your profile say is if are you wanting to be consistent with your character and have something that people can understand you know that you are a vampire you're playing that role um so there's the fiction and the consistency of realism Ooh, you make some really good points there that really uh made me think for a second there um yeah, consistency is a huge thing, you know that? Um, I, when you mentioned that, it, it just came to my mind, because um, on Siege, I play a vampire. I'm an exiled vampire, though. I'm a civilized vampire, is the way we put it, quote-unquote. Um, meaning, I don't grief. Not to say that all of the other vampires do grief, but some of them do. I refuse to be a part of that. That's not my part of RP. I'm not out to make people miserable. But as part of being evil, that's what many of the vampires on every shard do. They blanket that as evil. They're role-playing evil by making somebody miserable, whether that's res killing, griefing, or, um, dry looting, um, new players, crafters, everybody. No. Um, yeah, that that is... Um, Oh, that's some good stuff. I'm trying to go with my train of thought here. I I just had a Kendall moment. No, I'm just kidding, Kendall. (laughs) Um, I think I think that you're you're correct. There are people that um, I meet in game that are completely and absolutely evil. They role play evil characters. And granted, I'm not a saint in my character, but. I'll meet him at the, at the bank and have a great old conversation with him. And then two days later, I'm expecting the same conversation because I'm sitting in Cove somewhere, and all of a sudden, wham, I'm getting nailed and hit. And I'm like, whoa, I was just about to ask you how everything was going. <laughs> so we need a little consistency in the RP environment is where I was going with that. I finally caught my train of thought. Go ahead again, Mayor. Yeah, and um, something for the Feluca guilds. Um, when the mass murderers come in and raid, they are basically, I hope I don't offend anybody out there, they are role-playing mass murderers, and we know who those people are, and we have to bring in our defense forces against them. Um, those same mass murderers wanting to get into our fight nights, which is a, a an official Paxlair City event every Friday night in one of our, our, our uh, buildings, it's not really consistent to let those mass murderers into our fight night and just ignore what they've done before. Um, so what we try to do is role play with all, as much as we can, with all types of game styles. That's good. Um, matter of fact, we have a similar thing on Sundays on Siege. We have a fight night as well um, over in the Shire. 
And um, what they do is everybody, enemy or otherwise, is welcome. The same goes for the story nights that they have for the, our peers who like to tell stories like myself. Um, the way they handle it is, is an unspoken, uh, and this isn't the terminology they use, but the way I look at it from an RP vantage point so that I can justify the fact that there are uh, people who have uh, killed over and over in the same town is that they're given a temporary pardon for the day if they it kind of like parole if you screw up while you're there you blew your temporary pardon and you're out that way you still have some you know you still have some interaction you don't want to go um taking some of the best PVPers and that sort of thing out of a, a, an activity as a dueling activity um, that just doesn't build community bad and good go together in any case uh, Vice Frank go ahead uh, let's get your comment then we'll move on to the next, uh, next subject sure thing I, I just quickly want to know uh, what everybody role plays out there I know we got a bunch of role players out there and uh, me personally I want to quickly ask our guests here our panel guests as to what they role play and uh just to give you all an idea as to what I play, um, whenever I play my Smith, I'm usually playing the greedy, uh, you know, guy who wants to make a profit, you know, in whatever ways he can. He, you know, for the most part, is an evil guy, very rich. Um, also, a guy who wouldn't bother to, you know, wouldn't hesitate to hire a hitman to, you know, bump you off if if he didn't like you or didn't like something about your guild or whatever else. He's more of a politician, you know, type of guy who likes to, you know, get in there into the politics. A guy that likes, you know, conflict. <laughs> uh, so he likes to use, he likes to throw money around to make that happen. Uh, but then, uh, uh, then when it comes to my warrior. You know, I used to always play as a thief, you know, type of uh, archer fen fencer that would go around uh, stealing from people, try to provoke them into attacking me, and that's the kind of, you know, things I used to always role play whenever back in 1997 and stuff like that. But anyways, back to you, Spider. Yeah, I was the same way. Back in 97, 98, uh, what was the... Um in yeah, 97, 98, all the way through 2001, probably. Um, I was the same way as you. Um, I, I loved my thief slash assassin. I loved my uh, treasure hunter. Um, I, I played bad guys all the time. All the time. And, um, yeah, Dead I can uh, attest to that. That's for sure. <laughs> on many occasions over on Sonoma. Um, any case, uh, Kendall, uh, tell us about yours. Tell us about your characters. What do you role play? Well, mainly I role, play, I role play Kendall Richter, which is uh, the Guildmaster's cousin. The Guildmaster plays the Baron of Cove. Uh, he's Octavius, and I have my character created based on Octavius, who is uh, a noble. And so with my character, he, she's a fucking noble, Kendall is. And uh, she, she's very condescending. She expects everything to be handed to her, and she's not very likely to give respect to anybody. I've got other characters, too. Before I, Kendall, I had uh, Veldrin, who was a drow. And uh, she was the only drow, I think. Well, there's two drow in BOC, but I was, I guess I was supposed to be a uh, more noticeable drow. She was, <laughs> she was your drow, if you want to describe her. She was very evil, and she was more self, uh, self-concerned, and um, very easily, easily educated. She's very easily provoked, and that's, I guess that's the thing that everyone liked about her, is that you can easily make her angry. And um, another character that was in BOC was uh, Levy who was a, a craft person. She's uh, more timid, and she was uh, quieter. She was more graceful, and uh, she was just, you know, kind of a a very quiet character. Then there was Ira, my thief. He's uh, he's not in BSC. He has been, he never was, but he was, uh, he's a wandering thief, and he's, despite the, the connotation associated with the word thief, it's, uh, he's a very good-hearted and uh, polite kind of guy. He's even friendly, and he's, jokes around and he laughs but well he's doing that he's robbing you blind and you're you don't know whether to be charmed or whether to be uh, offended was just I hope the effect I'm giving but that's what role playing is it's role playing different roles it's different characters and I, I love them the characters I had so much fun with role playing them and Kendall's a newer one but that's all I can say for, for that part yeah I'm the same way as you um, I have multiple characters too I've cut down a, a little bit on mine um, basically, um, as everybody knows who's ever listened to me before, I play a vampire on Siege. Unfortunately, I moved off, and, and much to the chagrin 
of uh, VMP over on Siege, um, who, no, I'm very, I'm still good. They'll kill me on sight, but we still chat. Uh, they are brethren, after all. Um, I play a good vampire, <laughs> if there is such a thing. In any case, um, yeah, my other character is like yours, a drow. Um, same way, mean, nasty. Um, completely evil. And uh, kind of gets people worked up. Uh, Winfield, go ahead. Hey, he asked which uh, characters we play. Well, um, basically, I play Mara Winfield. And I may have other characters, but uh, it's not for public knowledge. You know, people know me uh, as the mayor of Paxlair. And in the art of uh, role-playing, I keep strict uh, rules to myself that no one else knows what the other characters are. And uh, it's an enjoyment just to see how they react. I may play a poor beggar. I may play an orc. Uh, not that I do. But uh, just to see how people react so that they don't know, oh, that's Mira Winfield. And then they treat me a different way. So I try to keep that as pure as possible. Yeah, that, that brings up a good point. And, um, yeah, I do want to get on the next subject. But at the same time, um, you know, for, for example, on Siege, we only allowed one character per account. Um, so people will buy multiple characters, and then they'll expect to play, you know, they'll play in one guild and then also in another. Well, when people find out about that, you know, so what happens when somebody finds out? Um, everybody, I, I'm pretty open about my characters. So, for example, when I was a Stratus reporter, I had my mandolin, who was the drunken storyteller, and everybody knew it was me, because Spider would never be there. Um, when, and then I had Spider Bite, and then, you know, whatever. Uh, in any case, um, yeah, no, that it, really, uh, role-playing is such a huge task, and people don't understand it. I know it takes a lot of work to be a PvPer, or a crafter, um, or a PK. It does take, no matter what your role is in, in UO, it takes a lot of work, and RP is not to be put down as slacking because, it, in my opinion, it takes a lot more work. Maybe not as much in-game work as far as mechanics go, but as far as um, thinking, um, being creative, that sort of thing, it's no different than the house customizers. Whatever. In any case... um. One thing I want to talk about on that same thing. Hey, you guys must use, as a guild, as guilds, um, a voice communication system of some sort, whether that's TeamSpeak or Vent or whatever you use, Ventrilo. Um, how do you guys work that as far as um, role-playing goes? Um, do you stay in character while you're in, in, in those voice chat programs? Or are you casual? In my own experience... Um, uh, the only person that ever stayed in character when I was with uh, Vampiric Embrace was the Guildmaster Worm. Constantly, 24-7, even in I IRC, or ICQ rather. Always in character. Sounded like something out of an old Bor Boris Karloff movie. Wonderful, though. I, I was fully entertained. But he stayed in character. Do you guys do that? And if not, what's the reason? Um, I think I saw Kindle's light, light, light up first. Go ahead. I think it was Winfield, actually, who went first. Okay, go ahead, Winfield. Uh, basically, yeah, we have uh, a Ventrilo server. 100 people can go on simultaneously for Paxlair uh, environment. And me personally, whenever I'm in the Ventrilo, I'm there as mayor, mayor of Winfield of Paxlair. Uh, other people will be more from a player perspective and talk about their different characters uh, or they'll go get their you know their PvP guy or they'll go get their mule or go get their craftsman and that's really the choice of the people in there uh, but there are several let's say role-playing purists that uh, will try to not let Ventrilo or TeamSpeak be the death of role-playing in, uh, in the shard environment Good point um, yeah, no, I have a hard time, a very hard time, uh, staying in character when I'm in TeamSpeak. Um, in my guild, um, it's very difficult to stay in character when you're watching uh, your in-game wife run across the streams, uh, screaming at the top of her lungs, 
ow, 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 get it off, get it off, get it off, as a couple of peregrine dragons are chasing her. It's very hard to stay in character, but that's just me. Um, go ahead, Kendall, let's hear what, what do you guys do in um, TeamSpeak or Vent or whatever you use? Are you, do you stay in character or not? Well, I can't really fathom how you guys use uh, voice chat. We don't use voice chat at all in our guild. I don't think any uh, any of the Europa guilds do either. I mean, and it's not just that uh, it'd be easier, but like Winfield is saying, if you have one character, you don't, everyone knows who Winfield is, and no one knows who uh, his other characters are. And if you have team speak, you kind of have to worry about which characters you're playing at the time. And also, I have both male and female characters. So if I'm playing my male character and I'm trying to roleplay you know, him while I'm on... Uh, Ventrial or something, I, I I would not be taken seriously as a male, and we have different characters who are played by other opposite genders. We use as uh, far as communication goes, we ma- use mainly ICQ and uh, party speak, well party chat in uh, UO. We don't use uh, voice chat at all. I can't really imagine how you guys manage that, but I think it'd be a lot harder to stay in character. I mean, even in the uh, ICQ, we're not in character at all. We we go back to our regular our regular selves. Um, we have uh, in command. We have guild command. We have different ranks, and everything. But uh, outside of uh, the game, we're still command, but we're not different ranks anymore. We don't rank each other. We're all the same, so we don't. We're not worried about uh, squawking each other. But it's not about um, staying in character. We just want to make sure we communicate clearly what we want to do, and everything in character is done in game. That way, nothing ha- ever ever happens uh, out of uh, nothing is. It's not, it doesn't mean, it makes it sure that nothing's non-linear. If you have something happens in uh, ICQ that doesn't happen in game, it's hard, it's hard to incorporate that into how you uh, what was happening in game at the time. I mean, how do you, how did that happen? How did it happen? When and where did it happen? But yeah, as far as chat goes, we don't use any voice chat at all. We only use ICQ. We, we say I have a character in ICQ. We don't use we, don't, we aren't in character at all. At least I'm not, and the guildmaster isn't. And um, it, it's different for me than it is for you guys. That's interesting, um, because, I mean, uh, basically, some of the guilds that I've been in the past, um, especially the PvP guilds, or PK guilds even more so, um, are, are, are well-oiled machines, and they, there's no way you can type, go left, no, go right, no, I mean go left, okay, they moved, go left again, there you go, you're, you're on them, get them, get them, hit, hit them with this, this, and this. There's no way you can do that through, um, in my opinion, through party chat or through um, guild chat or alliance chat. Um, by the time you finish typing that out, you're toast. You're looking at gray screen. Um, you know, as far as PVM goes, I can even say the same thing. You know, you have a bunch of people's health bars pulled down. That's great. But when you want to remind somebody to heal, like I get reminded constantly when I'm looking up and I go, oh, I am redlined. Because somebody yelled at me in TeamSpeak, heal, heal, now, heal. And I look up and go, ooh, uh, yeah, get, that might be a good idea. Because I'm not paying attention to the screen. I'm busy on whatever I'm doing. So, did I leave you? No, I'm here. So, as far as RP goes, are you guys, um, there is no RP done at all, other than Winfield. Uh, Kendall, I mean, you don't use any R- RP at all inside, or are there some of your guild members? There's no RP outside the outside the game, no. I think there's some outside the guild, but that's different. But there is no RP in uh, ICQ or Party Chat or anything. As far as orders go, however, in battle, we use uh, role-played orders, of course. I mean, if we're, going, if we're going to charge an enemy, we say, okay, do this, charge forth, and, you know, make sure everyone's healed. And uh, since we're not powerful, we don't, we're not using really powerful weapons, we're not using powerful armor, we're, we're pretty much relying on what we do. And um, in BOC, we uh, worry more about unity. We worry more about how we're going to do as work as a team. And when it comes to healing, we, um, we kind of make it as a rule to make sure you watch everybody else's health. We kind of group together really closely so we can heal each other. And uh, I always have everybody else's bars pulled up and make sure that they're all you know, all the, they're all green. I do sometimes make you know not pay attention, or I just kind of ignore that person because I don't like them very much. <laughs> but uh, we try to make sure that we heal each other, and that's if and if you're not healing, heal somebody, somebody else will. I mean, there's one other person or next to you, or this this group of five people charging forth, and we're not um, using like I say, like I said, we're not using 
powerful weapons. We're not using uh, lots of magic. We, we don't have a lot of mages in our guild. Um, we're, we're more we're working together. When it comes to the communication, it's kind of innate when it comes to the battle. But, um, you have to basically depend on what everyone else, what everyone else is doing. <laughs> and, um, uh, I'm having a Kindle moment, too. Um, as far as communication goes outside, you know, in character, if you do poorly in battle, it's because you weren't given the right orders by the by the uh, commanding officer, and that's when it comes. That's when it's RP. I mean, that's when if you fail, then if you if, if the technique is bad, then it was bad, and it, you know, um, and that's how it went. But and I see what you're saying about having to be coordinated. Uh, oh, see, so you can worry about who's doing what. And I guess we would be more aware of that in a real battle. But we don't really do that very much. I mean, we, we do some party speak. And it's not as fast paced as, as you might suggest it is, or as, it, as you make it sound like it is. It's also this big battle. And we do what we think is best at the time. We don't use a lot of communication. We uh, have battles like draw back and, uh, you know, attack this one mage. And when you do actually, when you do orders like attack this one mage, we try to keep that in party chat. It might be a little bit cheating right there, but we got to make sure that that person does not, does not know who he's going to be, know he's going to be, he's going to be a target. But as far as communication goes, it's also done prior. I mean, if we say, okay, take out the mage first, because he's going to be all doing all the, uh, the long distance spells, and then take out the archers, and then take out this one guy, because the mage is going to protect this other guy. And uh, basically it's, Technique. We'll worry, about, we'll worry about how you perform rather than how you communicate during battle. And I guess that might be a little bit impractical for you guys, but it's the way we do it here. No, that's pretty impressive, actually. To, to be honest, that's very impressive. Um, like I said, I've, I've, I've ran with um, many, many, many guilds, and um, almost all of them, you know, if you're not in voice chat, you're lost at some point. Uh, of course, you have to have UO auto map. And, you know, you got to keep track of everybody. That's that's very impressive, Kendall. Um, that you guys are able to do that without any for, sort of uh, voice communication, um, especially when you go hit the harder spawns or the or raid another guild that is huge. Um, there's nothing like being told, "Hey, hit hit a left quick," and the missing, you know, getting missed by a reverend or whatever. In any case, um, we're going to start winding it up a little bit here. Uh, actually, what I'm going to probably do is start uh, g- give it over to uh, Viceroy here. I'll, I'll, I'll give us our next topic, and then uh, what I want to do uh, today, because I, I really did want to do this uh, to begin with, but um, I think it's better to end it off, end the show off this way. Um, Kendall, I, I would like you to tell tell us about your guild, uh, what you guys are about. Um, are you recruiting? You know, basically, I'm giving you a shot to plug yourself right here. Uh, so go ahead and do that. Um, I want to give you about two minutes. Uh, take your time. And uh, go ahead and uh, go for it. Well, all right. Um, of course, our, our Baron Troop of Cove is based around Cove. And we have a Baron that we follow and are very loyal to. And um, he's he oversees the entire guild. And uh, the main part of the guild is mostly uh, militia-based. We're more... We're, um, we have had other branches of uh, civilian and uh, orcs, like I said, and thieves, but mostly the bulk of our guild is just militia. And uh, we're kind of about a realistic-ish, realistic, not, not quite realistic, but we try to keep it uh, as non-magical as possible. We have mages, but we don't have very many mages. We try to limit, limit our mages. We want to make everybody so that it's not so, you know, fantastic. We don't allow elves either. I don't think we allow elves. We might allow a few, but... We don't think we let any elves. We don't let, we don't let you any use uh, many elf weapons either. I mean, we're, when we came, when Mon- Monland's legacy came out, we were pretty uh, worried about that. But back to the subject, um, we're as far as code goes, it's very ambitious. I mean, you're trying to the, the Baron by himself is actually uh, a, a little nutty. <laughs> he's trying to take over these other these other uh, towns, and everything, and he's never succeeding. And of course, it's because of the towns that want to uh, OC that they want to let him succeed, but. As far as uh, the theme inside our guild, we're uh, pretty medieval, I suppose, if you want to compare it to a real-life reference. It's very uh, almost realistic, and we don't, we don't let any necromancy or any samurai skills. It's not very English. I mean, why do they even do this Japanese skills if we're not going to be Japanese? I mean, it started out just to be this, uh, this you know, kind of old ages kind of type thing in dark ages. 
and that's what we kind of keep to kind of make sure it's still uh, you know dark age themed we have uh, dragons and we have uh, kings and we don't have kings we have barons and we have uh, swords and we have shields and we have bows and arrows we don't have any we don't have many magic many magic wielders and we don't have any necromancers we we are recruiting we uh always accept new members we love new members we do we do accept mages as long as uh, they follow our rules and you don't allow any area spells to be cast because they they seem kind of over advantageous um we very much like any kind of we like paladins we like uh archers we like swordsmen we like um uh, stealthers we have a lot of stealthers actually we have a big uh, a squad of stealthers and uh, we call them uh, scouts uh the theme of Cove is actually very jovial. We're very faithful, loyal to each other, and uh, we're about to always uh, say, in the name of the Baron, I think, and we say, for Cove, and it's just kind of a, the thing we do. It's a very happy community, very uh, closely knit, I suppose. Um, there are other guilds with different themes, and I very much like Cove. In my opinion, Cove is the best role-playing guild on Europa, as far as organization goes and quality of role-play. I'd never seen anything better. Sounds great. It really does. No, I, 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 I will have to um, actually uh, go revive. I've, I've got an, a quote-unquote princess spider. When I, back when I was a Stratus reporter, that was my reporter's name, on every single shard out there. And I'll have to come visit you guys. Um, Mayor Winfield, go ahead. Why don't you give us a... Um, Quick rundown of what your guild does over uh, over in Pax Player, and um, you know, are you recruiting? Whatever. Okay. Well, first of all, Pax Player's not a guild. It's a uh, it's a city, as you know. Uh, actually, multiple I cities. So it's no, it's fine. It's uh, we have probably about a dozen guilds that are part of Pax Player, associated with one or more of the four primary cities that we have throughout uh, Chesapeake. We have uh, a government. Uh, our number one goal is to set up a role-played government with various positions that people can strive for. Uh, they get appointed to those various positions. For example, we have a Minister of Defense that uh, is in charge of both Trammel-based and uh, Feluca-based uh, events or attacks, and that has to carry the spectrum of a role-played kind of thing, and it's always in role-playing. But uh, we have defense capabilities amongst those guilds. We have quick reaction capabilities. We basically have people as part of Pax Lair, and we've tried to set up all our cities to accommodate the different types of players that like to do different things, everything from PvP and peerlesses to, uh, to pure storylines and quests. There are some people who that's all they do is they, uh, they uh, work on quests, um, build various facilities, we have uh, libraries. We have a court system. Uh, I'm a I'm the judge, as well of the Pax Lair community, and we just had a uh, a court case the other day of a criminal that was basically storyline based and actions in game and reported in our news of a certain individual brought to the court system, and uh, at the end of that court, uh, the person was found guilty for assault, and what we did and and it was role played, but it was all in game was I judged that the person was guilty and in order to punish the person the sentence was to smash the individual's hand out on the chopping block not cut it off but smash it what that created was a role playing uh, event kind of uh, a problem solving thing that people could uh, figure out okay how do we repair this hand and what does that person do now that has a broken hand uh, that person took game mechanics and removed some skills for barding so that person could no longer play a loot. So we, we, we have people that try to do everything extremely creative to basically just uh, interested in combat. Uh, we try to have relationships with many towns throughout uh, Chesapeake, sister cities, things like that. And um, basically a lot of diplomacy goes on, but we try to have an environment where people can be part of a community from the whole end of the spectrum, whether it's PvP or, or questing and role-playing, putting on plays, we've done that. So it's, it's kind of a robust thing we've tried to design. Granted, we do not have uh, a million people. We don't have 100 people. We have probably 25 people of 
You know, these dozen or so guilds that are extremely involved in Pax Lair, but the guilds members don't have to all be entrenched in the Pax Lair environment. They go off and do a lot of things. Basically, the town environment, the city environment, is a place for people to come together when they want to come together. It's flexible. People can visit. People can get involved. They can hang out there for two weeks and get involved in things that we do. And that's the realism when you're immersed in the game, immersed in the realm, is the kind of realism we try to strive for. That's really impressive. That, that is very impressive. Both of, both of your guilds are, actually. Um, hearing about them is great. Um, at this point in the show, since we're running over, um, what I'd like to do is hand it over to Viceroy, uh, because what I need to do is run off and go role-play an actual DJ. <laughs> Here on your radio. So what I'm going to do is to say goodnight. I want to thank um, Kendall and Winfield. You guys have been great guests tonight and very patient with me on my first day and my birthday, believe it or not. Can you believe that? I did that today. When did a debut and a birthday all in one day. And I quit smoking. In any case, um, I'm already on my DJ kick. Can you tell? I'm going to pass this over to Viceroy. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening in. And uh, hopefully it's been recorded and we will have it up for those who couldn't listen. Uh, tomorrow. Yep. Go ahead and fight. Thank you very much, uh, Spider Bright, and uh, happy birthday to you, uh, by the way, and uh, congratulations on quitting smoking. Uh, but I want to go ahead and quickly point out here to everybody out there uh, the websites for these two uh, incredible uh, guilds and slash towns, uh, in which you can go check out later. If you'd like to uh, go over there and check out the Baron Ship of Cove on Europa, you can do so by going to http colon slash slash cove dot uh, fantasyworld.nl which is uh, the country abbreviation for I believe the Netherlands uh, so be sure to check out that website uh, and also if you'd like to check out Paxlayer you can do so by going to www.paxlayer.com and last but not least be sure to check out yourradio.com always uh, because we're always uh, putting up uh, events and stuff like that and uh, be sure to check out the forums uh, come over here in IRC chat with us during the shows Make a donation to your radio if you'd like to help us uh, remain on the air and keep bringing you more shows like this in the future. Uh, and all kinds of great things. Uh, so stick around. Uh, we got DJ uh, Spider Bite coming up next. And uh, so that's going to go ahead and uh, conclude episode number 27 right here on February 25th, 2006. And thank you for tuning in, everybody. This is DJ Viceroy on Chesapeake, signing off. <laughs>